McGinty's terrific. But did you ever wonder how he does it? After all, McGinty had to use every bit of skill he had before he could get that lion trained. He had to overcome a wild beast's instinctive fear and distrust, get his interest and confidence before he could teach him the simplest trick. Of course, prospects aren't as ferocious as McGinty's lion, and they won't respond to exactly the same treatment in the same way. But a prospect has the same basically instinctive distrusts and fears, the same vigilant barriers of resistance to anything or anyone new or strange. Without gaining his favorable attention and then turning that attention to a positive interest in your proposition, you won't have a chance to sell. In fact, you may not even have a chance to talk. When you've located and qualified a prospect, and then made an adequate pre-approach to gather every helpful fact you can about him and determine the best way to present your proposition to him, you have a lot at stake in making your approach. So let's get behind the prospect's door and see how the view is from the other side. We talk to a secretary who sees salesmen, lots of them. Some of them never get a chance to start selling, never get in to see her boss. She told us a few things that might have surprised some of the men who were calling on her boss. Of course, Mr. Wilson, my employer, makes his own decisions on whom he'll see. But it's my job to find out what a man's calling for. And Mr. Wilson usually asks me what he looks like, too. I've seen salesmen day after day until I've got a kind of mental file of character types. If you want to know who doesn't get any help from me in seeing my boss, here they are. The breezy boy has everything but the spotted vest. His hat's probably glued on. He couldn't talk without a cigar. Every secretary is toots to him. He thinks he's a killer, but I only wonder how he manages to get so much dirt under his fingernails. If he's asked to wait at all, he's usually deep in a serious study of the latest racy magazine. The big time operator is another. He always has a plane to catch in 30 minutes, and he mushed all the way from Alaska to see Mr. Wilson. He thinks I'm a built-in accessory to the desk, some sort of a mechanical relay to the boss. He expects me to roll a red carpet right into the inner sanctum. Maybe he gets in, but not with my help. Oh. The apologetic type is the worst of all. You'd think he was carrying stolen goods. He acts as though he's hoping he won't get in, and he usually doesn't. You feel sorry for a person who seems ashamed of what he's doing, but you can't admire him or want him around. He may not know it, but he's better off not seeing Mr. Wilson. Of course, those types are pretty far-fetched. Few salesmen are exactly like them. But you find some of those traits in so many salesmen. When you see someone who looks and acts like a gentleman, who treats you with courtesy, who doesn't get impatient, even when he has to wait, who acts as though he expects to be received, well, somehow, he almost always is received. Well, that's only a secretary's point of view, you might say. And she doesn't do the buying. But the point is this. You have to sell anybody who stands between you and your prospect before you can approach your prospect. Just to keep getting a view from the other side, let's get behind Mr. Wilson's desk for a bit. When we asked him for his opinion, he said, Yes, I probably rely more than I realize on my secretary's impression in deciding whom I'll see. 
that when he finally gets into my office, his appearance and actions do form my own first impression of him, favorable or bad. What should he be? Well-groomed, good carriage and manners, good speech. All hard to define, but any lack of these, any sloppiness or loud dress, furtiveness, over-familiarity, or fast-talking high pressure, and I start thinking of the fastest way of getting rid of him. Beyond that, I'm also influenced by my interest or lack of interest in what he represents, whether it's a product or an idea. This young fellow got my favorable attention from the start. He made a good appearance and seemed to have all the attributes necessary to a good salesman. I didn't buy. I liked him, but I didn't have any interest in his proposition, and I told him so before he could waste any of my time or his. Well, there's a young fellow who made a favorable impression, but he didn't get a chance to demonstrate his proposition. The reason? He failed to change Mr. Wilson's favorable attention to a positive interest in his proposition. On the other hand, Mr. Wilson told us that although he believed he had all the insurance he could possibly use, a young salesman, Bill Rawson, had just sold him a policy. But let's let Bill Rawson tell us how he did it. Well, I'd secured quite a bit of information from another customer of mine about Mr. Wilson, but he wouldn't let me use his name. Shh. Said Mr. Wilson was a little touchy about insurance and felt he didn't need it. He actioned for his family. But like most successful men, he hadn't thought of himself. So I worked up a retirement program for him. I introduced myself to his secretary and asked to see Mr. Wilson if it was convenient. She asked my business, of course, but I just showed her the program with Mr. Wilson's name on it and told her I had a plan that I'd like to discuss with him. After a few minutes, I was shown into his office. Before I could ask the question I had ready for him, he said, I understand you have a plan for me, Mr. Rawson. Could it be insurance? I was jolted, but I laughed and asked my question anyway. Mr. Wilson, is it true that you intend to retire this year? No, he was startled. Where had I heard that? I told him a man in his position was always the subject of speculation and admiration to many people. He was at the peak of his career, known for his physical energy, mental keenness, and his ability to relax even under pressure. He admitted he had never felt better. I asked him if that wasn't due to a wide range of interests, business, family, and hobbies. He agreed and mentioned that he spent most of his free time as weekend farmer on his place in the country, which I already knew. It's a good thing, too, he said, because I'm carrying a lot of obligations, including a heavy load of insurance. While he said that, he looked right at the plan I held. I said I knew he was the kind of man who would think of his family before himself and take every step to protect them against accidents, illness, or even death. But I said, the chances are more likely that you'll be teaching your grandchildren something about farming. That's why I asked, when are you going to retire? He hadn't given that a thought. Felt he could take care of it when the time came. I said, Mr. Wilson, I know you haven't been able to take time to think of yourself, and I also know you're a good businessman. If this plan I have prepared for you makes sense, if it can show you a sound method which guarantees you complete freedom of choice, as to when and how you retire, without relying on any factor of chance, you'd be interested in hearing about it, wouldn't you? He reached for the plan, but I drew it back a little to point to his name on the cover and explain that it was prepared not just for a man in his position, but specifically for him. I asked him to make a few notes as I went through the plan, and then I moved into my demonstration. I sold Mr. Wilson that plan. Not easily, of course, and not on one call. But I sold it because I made him see what it would do for him, made him realize that now was the time to start it. Thanks, Bill Rawson. 
Well, fellas, you can see now that from a secretary's or prospect's point of view, there are a lot of things that can spoil an approach. Watching Bill Rawson, you can see the basic essentials of a good approach. Rawson earned his interview because he had planned for it and because he was confident that he had something of real value for Mr. Wilson. And because Rawson had prepared, because he was ready with a provocative question and an attractive method of presenting his plan, he changed Mr. Wilson's favorable attention into a positive interest in his proposition. And when you've done that, you'll have your chance to sell that proposition. Thank you.